terrified. It was supposed to be really, really creepy. What's up seekers welcome back to the channel man hopefully you guys um you're doing all right man if you guys are brand new here man what we do is we break down scary and creepy videos man on and there on the web from youtube videos to tiktok videos to ig reels facebook reels man anything weird usually unexplained you can find right here on this channel just want to thank the seekers who's been tapping in with us man subbing up to the channel liking the videos i greatly appreciate that man that's how we grow the seekers that's how we grow our community so guys hit that like button subscribe Found this video for you guys today, man. Let's do what we do best. Seek the truth, Seekers. Here we go. The worst thing I've ever heard of happening at a theme park. This roller coaster was called the Smiler at Alton Towers in the UK. This is the mm. promo for the ride. It was supposed to be really, really creepy. This happened on June 2nd, 2015. The staff sent an empty car to like test the tracks and the car stopped in the middle of the tracks of the roller coaster. They then sent a car full of people down the tracks when this empty car was just sitting here. So the people collided into the empty roller coaster car. I obviously can't show you the video on here or this video will get taken down, but it's terrifying because these people like see the car sitting there and they know they're going to crash into it. And there's a video of the aftermath where the car that they're in is just swinging back and forth and they're screaming and crying in pain. It's, it's horrible. Five people needed serious treatment. Two people shattered their knees mm. and one person had to get their leg amputated. It's all so terrifying. I can't even imagine. And of course, this video is informational and I mean no disrespect to anyone involved. If you like my content, follow my TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube for more. It really helps when you been around. Surgery in the eight. Seekers, bro. Like I said, I'm not even that freaking that kind of big of roller coasters, man. I remember when I went to the freaking amusement park, bro. Um, so everybody's getting on the freaking big roller coasters. I'm like, nah, I'm good, bro. <laughs> that ain't for me. I don't know, like a couple, man. But that's freaking insane, bro. The head that they said they sent roller coaster ahead and they stopped their tracks and they still sent another one full of people like i don't know what was going through that person's head when they decided to do that plan but that was like a freaking demented plan bro like who does something like that man just to see i guess to see what type of results they can get and that promo was freaking weird as hell too seekers man i guess that promo was a sign bro 1800s was fucking insane literally no anesthesia no fucking drugs you was awake while motherfuckers was chopping you up one of the professional choppers robert liston was literally one of the fastest surgeons which is good because you obviously want that shit to be over with fast one day he was working so fast on a patient that he accidentally cut off two of his assistant's fingers both the patient and his assistant later died of gangrene Oh, that's not all. Also, during the procedure, he accidentally swiped his blade past one of the elderly doctor's coats. The elderly doctor thought he was cut and literally went into shock and had a heart attack. So this motherfucker literally killed three people trying to save one. Crazy seekers. This teen took revenge on his ex in the most horrific way. On June 3rd, 17-year-old Madison Schmitz was stabbed by her ex-boyfriend, 18-year-old Spencer Pearson, outside a restaurant in Jacksonville. On this day, Madison, her mother Jackie, and a friend were sitting at a restaurant named Mr. Chubby's Wings when they noticed Spencer sitting at a table not too far from them. You see, Madison and Spencer had been broken up for a couple of months now, but he has been harassing her by following her to school and leaving notes on her car. So when they spotted Spencer sitting close to the 
at the restaurant and they quickly left. Spencer followed Madison and her mother to the parking lot. He threw Madison to the ground and began stabbing her. Madison was stabbed 15 times. Many of these wounds hit her back, which caused her to be paralyzed. Madison's mother was also stabbed in the head and leg while she tried to protect her daughter. This man who happened to be there intervened and tried to stop Spencer and as a result, he was stabbed in the hand. When police were on their way, Spencer slit his throat in an attempt to take his own life, but he was unsuccessful. Spencer has been charged with two counts of attempted premeditated murder and aggravated battery with a deadly weapon. So about 10 minutes. Sick as man. Like I said, you gotta watch out for people like that, bro. When you're in a relationship, man, because once, they, once it ends or something, bro, you don't know that that'll send them over cliff and not. Look what happened, man. You just fall and stalk me, bro. And look at the result of what happened, man. Such a tragic case. Like see him, yeah. like, imagine you going to, like, a restaurant, I guess you have with your parents or something, and you know, if you ex, it's just like, you see him following you. That would always throw me off right there, but I don't want you to actually try to leave the restaurant because you want witnesses, man. Get some trying to happen, some try to go down, look what happened. As soon as they left, that's when he made his move. Things, man, people would do, bro, just to get back at the ex in a relationship. It's truly terrifying. Secrets. Minutes ago, there was an update in the disappearance of Nicola Bully. Nicola went missing last Friday whilst walking her dog near the River Wire. And just moments ago, police released a CCTV image of a woman walking her dog who they now believe may have been the last person to see Nicola. It's important to note that the police want to talk to this woman as a potential witness and not a potential suspect. In fact, police have now said that they have no reason to suspect that a third party is involved with Nicola's disappearance. Authorities are continuing an extensive search of the river as well as searching an old abandoned house near to where Nicola went missing. Hopefully, Nicola will be located soon and her family and friends will have answers. A man just tried to end the lives of a woman and two young children by driving his Tesla off of a 250 meter cliff. The only problem is, all four of them somehow survived. The cliff is known as Devil's Slide, and when authorities were informed of the incident, they assumed that they'd be retrieving bodies, until they noticed movement from inside the vehicle. One official said, we go there all the time for cars over the cliff, and they never live. This was an absolute miracle. The man and the woman sustained serious but non-life-threatening injuries, while the two children came out unharmed. So the question is, was this extremely lucky or, or a W for Tesla? Damn. Are Tesla's that adorable secrets? If you can tell the name of that freaking cliff they went off, that's like you know, a bad omen, bad sound already, but to hear that they had significant the two adults had significant no, non-significant injuries and the kids came out unscathed, that's just a pure miracle right there, secrets. I don't know if that's Tesla or if that was something else, man. But he tried to end it all, bro, and nothing even happened, bro. Whew. Somebody was looking out for that whole family. What do you guys think, Seekers, man? That's a, a bizarre case, bro. Truly. this video unless you have a very strong stomach. This case is truly sickening. On August the 31st, 2019, Margaret Sumney was unreachable. Her family knew something was wrong. They tried and failed to get hold of her for two days before notifying police to ask them to do a welfare check. When police went to her house in Pennsylvania, what they discovered was horrifying. They found shattered glass all over the floor and blood smeared on the walls. They found a 67-year-old's body in the bath. She'd been beaten to death. Mm. The autopsy revealed that she died from blunt force trauma to the head. Police interviewed her son, David, who initially denied having anything to do with her death. 
However, police searched his phone and found absolutely disgusting images. They uncovered 277 sickening pictures, including selfies of David with her body, his face smeared in her blood and doing a thumbs up pose. Police also discovered that David was in possession of his mum's jewellery and several blank checks. He also had a record of previously assaulting his mother twice and attacking his now deceased father once. The same year as his mum's murder, he allegedly waterboarded and strangled his ex-girlfriend in an Atlantic City hotel. It's reported though that he just slipped through the cracks in the police databases, allowing him to go on to offend again. He was soon arrested and it was found that when he'd committed the murder of his mother, he'd taken a large amount of Adderall. His defence argued that he had diminished responsibility due to his substance and alcohol use. Originally, he was facing charges of first-degree murder and abuse of a corpse. However, due to a legal loophole, he entered a guilty plea, so he would only be charged with third-degree murder. He was sentenced to 20 to 40 years in prison. Terrifyingly, as he's now been in prison since 2019, and due to his good behaviour behind bars, he could be released in just 17 years. See, because I already got stinks. I don't think he should get freaking off like that man it's like bro like they said he had a pattern or history of attacking people before and they said he just they didn't pick up on him because he just slipped through the freaking cracks man i'm telling you the system sometimes it's fair sometimes it's not man but they had like you said he had a history of doing that to people and he just let it slip through the cracks and they said due to a leap on a loophole he got that low sentence and the hair could be even lowered again. I'm like, I don't think so, Seekers, man. And he did that to his own freaking mom, bro. Your own blood, bro. Can't trust anybody, man. Family, friends. Nobody's the exception. What do you guys think, Seekers? This is a man who killed his family twice. Gregory Green is a convicted murderer who completely failed at his second chance at life. In his early 20s, he married Tanya Green. It wasn't long into the marriage that Gregory started to show some signs of abusiveness, such as jealousy, anger, and violence. While Tanya was six months pregnant with Gregory's child, she threatened to leave him for good once she got home. But Tanya never got the chance because as soon as she got home, Gregory stabbed her with a steak knife 10 times, killing her and their unborn child. Gregory was given a 15 to 25 year sentence in prison, and during his time there, he was denied parole four times. However, during his time in prison, he gained lots of support from friends and family and grew really close to a pastor named Fred Harris, who helped him find God, and he was his biggest supporter of getting him out. In 2008, Gregory was released on parole after serving 16 years in prison. And after just two years on parole, he was a completely free man. Shortly after that, he married his second wife, Faith Harris Green, who was the daughter of the pastor he was working with in prison. They were married for six years, and Faith had a 19 and 17 year old child from a previous marriage, and Gregory and Faith had a five and six year old child. Over the course of their marriage, Gregory started to show the same signs of abusiveness as he showed before. And Faith also tried to file a restraining order, but was denied. Things got really ugly in 2016 when Gregory poisoned his two young children that were sleeping up stairs, took Faith to the basement, tied her to a chair, and beat her. He then brought down his stepchildren and shot them in front of her. Faith survived the encounter and Gregory was sentenced to prison yet again and won't be eligible for parole until he's 97 years old. Imagine getting arrested. See, because, man, we know you hear the expression about everybody deserves a second chance, but he literally had a second chance and he wasted it and it was a pattern that or a cycle you just could not get out of, man. And to do that to the freaking pastor who was there for you, man, the don't <sighs> Sickening case seekers. Did that to his own kids, man, and to the stepkids as well. That's just traumatizing them, man. I'm just like, what's the point? You know, everybody deserves a second chance, but it's people like that that makes people, that's why people sometimes say people don't deserve a second chance, that he's one of the prime examples. Said ...for having a child with a dead body. Jennifer Burroughs is a 26-year-old who was working at a morgue when she was arrested after a DNA test proved her child's father was a dead body she was supposed to autopsy. But it actually gets worse from here. Because while Jennifer was working as an assistant pathologist at the morgue, she had relations with more than 60 bodies, belonging to men aged 17 to 71 years old. She did this for two years until it led to the birth of her son. 
Her son's father was a 57-year-old veterinarian from Texas who passed away in a car accident in 2017. Jennifer was charged with 158 counts of indecent treatment of a corpse. Many psychologists and experts have debated why someone would do this. The reasons range from curiosity to severe mental illness. Some even believe Jennifer was suffering from psychosis. All right, after all that, I don't really know how to end this video, so stay safe out there and follow for more. This triple zero yeah, call some. is absolutely horrifying. It's a call made by 26-year-old Jessica Camilleri after she just attacked her mother with seven knives, taken off her head, and walked outside with it in her hand. Hello, it's Allison from Police Emergency. We just received a call from this number. Uh, yes, I need you to get the ambulance and the police out the up immediately. So, which address? Uh, 128 Sunset Avenue, Police Park. I need you to park immediately. I'll grab the knife because I thought she was going to stab me, so I stabbed her back. And I was so heated up with anger, I just kept stabbing and stabbing and stabbing her. And I, I, I took off her head. Jessica suffers from multiple mental health disorders as well as ADHD and OCD. Her mother was trying to get her help after multiple incidents of Jessica assaulting people in public, pulling their hair and threatening to shred their heads. She also made hundreds of phone calls to random numbers saying things like, I'll come to your house with a knife and shred your head to the neck. On this fateful night, July 20th, 2019, Jessica's mm -hmm. mother, Rita, was at home with a younger relative, a little boy that hasn't been named due to his age. Jessica hated the fact that this younger relative was in the house, and her and her mother got into a heated argument. Jessica dragged Rita by her hair to the kitchen, grabbed a kitchen knife, and began stabbing over and over. Each time one of the knives broke, she'd grab another and continue the attack. At one point, the four-year-old child that was witnessing the attack actually tried to save Rita. He jumped on Jessica and hit her over the head with the lid of a toy box. Mm. She threw him off and actually slashed his cheek and his arm and hand in the process. Damn. She then continued the attack on Rita. Most of the blows were aimed at Rita's face, head and neck. She stabbed Rita through the eye socket, took off her nose and tongue, and then twisted her head clean off, walked outside with it in her hand, and went to a neighbor's house. She then made that triple zero phone call, and when police arrived, she told them, my mother's head is on the concrete over there. Can you sew it back on? Jessica's trial began, and the court was played the triple zero phone call, as well as body cam footage, that showed Jessica repeatedly asking police if they could bring her mother back to life and reattach her head. In 2020, Jessica was cleared of murder by a jury and instead convicted of manslaughter, after her defence lawyers argued that she was impaired by a mixture of mental disorders. She was sentenced to 21 years with a non-parole period of 16 years. However, this year she appealed that sentence and she won. Her non-parole period was reduced, meaning she'll be eligible for parole in 2031, when she'll be 37. See, because that case of freaking twist and turn, bro. What the hell that freaking call? It's chilling, man. I don't see how people can just do that after they make do like a horrific act like that. They can just be so calm on the phone talking and just saying what they did. She took off her mom's head. And the four year old kid, kid freaking trying to, like, he even knew, like, imagine being a kid that young, but that kid knew something was going on and tried, and tried to help, like, four years old, having to see that. Scarring that kid for life, sheepish man. Tragic case. <laughs> Take a deep breath. I can understand you. I've already got 
help Tommy. I need you to tell me why and what. I'm plan. I'm on plan. Squire. Just a minute. I'm walking. He shot me. Okay, you're on choir in Glenview Court? He shot me. Okay, where did he shoot you? In the chest. In the chest? He's over there. She ended it all. I'm like, you know, the police stay on the phone. Like I said, I'm talking. You gotta like try to freaking calm them down, but they going through a traumatic event, so you know they they not thinking, man. So you, you trying to tell a person to calm down in an event like that? I don't think that's gonna work. You just gotta try to work through a secret in. But well, to her, she got freaking shot in the chest, and she still was able to make that call. Just to show you the, the strength that she had. Hmm. It's a freaking terrifying call, too. They had a mate. I, like, I guess he was chasing after her in the, in the turquoise truck. And she was on foot. I can see this. First ever footage of Madeline McKenna after the event. Hmm? Spotted on the May 2000. This girl had heterochromia and was seen to miles from the crime scene. What the hell happened? We're gonna dive deep into that one, Seekers. And then, yeah, young and lovely, the girl from Ebenezer was walking, and when she passes, which when she passes. Seeking, man, these cases, they be flashing sometimes, but the Mr. Cruel case. Tell me down below, man, if you guys got any information on that, man. We're going to have to freaking look that one up, man, because he says it's a true comment, and it's enough for her to keep her up at night, but that case did, so something shocking must happen in that case. We got to check that out. This is one of the most high profile pedophiles in Hollywood, Jeffrey Jones. You might recognize Jeffrey from a number of movies he's been in, like Ferris Bueller's Day Off, The Hunt for Red October, and Beetlejuice. It's highly ironic to me that in a lot of the movies he was in, Jeffrey Jones played the villain, and he ended up being one in real life. So after his career flourished in the late 80s and 90s, let's fast forward to 2002. That year, Jeffrey was arrested for the possession of CP, if you know what I'm talking about, and he was accused by a 17-year-old boy of soliciting him to take nude photos. These charges get even more disturbing when you realize that the young boy who accused Jeffrey of soliciting him to take nude photographs was 14 when the charges were originally brought up and the accusations were made. Mm. Jeffrey pleaded no contest to the solicitation. He openly admitted that he had done this horrible thing. But once again, because of legal loopholes, because he admitted to this and pled no contest, that meant that the other CP charges were completely dropped. And what happened to Jeffrey after all this? Well, he got five years probation. He also had to go through counseling and register as a sex offender. And yes, if you're wondering, to this day, he is still registered as a sex offender. You can find the records of all of this online. Mm. But it seems like Jeffrey didn't want to be known as a sex offender throughout his life. But it seems like Jeffrey didn't want to be known as a sex offender mm. for the rest of his life. And he would end up being arrested twice for failing to update his sex offender registration. And in 2006, when working on the set of the movie, Who's Your Caddy? The community of Aiken, South Carolina, where the film was being filmed, complained to the government and complained that a sex offender was on set. This was due to the fact that families had been invited to visit the set with their children and they had no idea that there was a predator lurking amongst the crew. To this day, a lot of people don't know what this guy has done and even Justin Bieber posted a photo with him a couple years back and a lot of people were obviously a little mad about that. And I think it's important to realize that these people are everywhere. They're your friends, your family, your neighbors. They're even celebrities. And at the end of the day, even the people that you look up to and have seen a million times on the silver screen could be the worst people you've ever met in real life. Mm -hmm. If you like these types of stories, give me a follow or listen to my wife and I's podcast, Murder in America. This is what... Secrets, bro. Like I say, you gotta watch out for people like that. 
And just because he freaking played that, no guilty guns. Like, he, the other charges are freaking dropped. And because, like, it's St. Louis and Hollow and stuff like that, so you don't know what went on behind the scenes to make those freaking charges drop. But then he said he was used to playing freaking villains and the, and, and the roles he was given. He was a villain in real life, man. The freaking a mirror of his freaking real life. Like like I said, see, because both these the medias we be watching, man, the people behind the bus, it's always a, it's always a story to tell, bro. And real life, too. Like I said, we think we're just watching a short movie, but that can affect freaking real life as well. And Justin Bieber took a picture with him? How is he still in the freaking... Get that still getting work after that. Behind the scenes, some stuff went on, Seekers, bro. I'm trying to tell you. It's one of the most horrific stories I've come across, and that takes a lot. It's the story of Otty Sanchez and baby Scotty. Hmm. Your discretion is advised, it's graphic, and it's disturbing. Otty was a 33-year-old former healthcare worker in San Antonio, Texas. She'd undergone psychiatric treatment for schizophrenia and she'd been in and out of psychiatric wards for mental health problems. She was suffering from these problems when she met her boyfriend Scott, who was also in the healthcare profession and also suffered from schizophrenia. Otty fell pregnant and in July 2009 she gave birth to a son who the couple named Scotty. Mm. Scott said she was a brilliant mother, she breastfed her son and cared for him like any mother would. Otty absolutely doted on her son, but after his birth, she began suffering from postnatal depression. Her mental health declined and she was admitted into hospital on July 20th. She was released less than a day later, despite the fact that she'd refused to take medication to help with her intrusive thoughts. She told her boyfriend Scott that she was suffering with PND and schizophrenia and she'd be taking Scotty and going to live with her mom, sister and nieces. Five days later, she brought Scotty to see his dad, but after asking for a copy of the birth certificate, she flew into a rage, took Scotty in his car seat, threw it into the passenger seat of the car, and drove off. Scott reported this instance to the police, fearing for his son's safety, but the police merely marked it down as a disturbance. By now, Otty was suffering from postpartum psychosis. She'd expressed to officers and medical professionals that she was hearing voices, and she feared she may harm her son. Despite all of her concerns, Scotty was left in her care, and on July 26, 2009, the unthinkable happened. When officers arrived at the home, they saw a scene that was so horrific they had to seek counselling. Otty had used three bladed weapons to stab, kill, 
dismember and decapitate her three-week-old son. She'd then eaten parts of his brain, his foot and his nose, saying that the devil had told her she had to do this in order to kill the demon inside her and stop an apocalypse. Otty had then stabbed herself and slashed her own throat. Otty was arrested and charged with capital murder, but after being examined by three separate doctors who all determined she was legally insane, she was found not guilty by reason of insanity. Otty was admitted to a state mental institution where she'll stay until the jury determines that she's not a risk to herself or others. Volunteer in case you guys. <laughs> before that the clown was sick as man still sends a chill down through my spine Seekers, if you guys made it with me to the end of the video, you're a true seeker, seeking the truth. I appreciate you guys. I appreciate your support, man. Like I said, in order for the seekers to grow, I need you guys to do so, some simple things, man. Hit that like button, subscribe, comment down below, man. Tell me what you guys think of the video. Hit that post notification bell. That's it, man. Like I said, I appreciate the support seekers, bro. Been uploading every day this month, man. Haven't missed a day, so I'm really proud of myself for that. Hopefully, April, man, we can do the same thing. Keep this rolling. You guys, gonna catch you in the next one, man. I'm out. Peace, seekers. What's up, seekers? Welcome back to the channel, man. Hopefully, you guys are doing all right, man. If you guys are brand new here, if you guys don't know what we do, we break down scary and creepy videos, man. On the net, on the web, man, from YouTube videos to TikTok videos, IG reels, Facebook reels, anything weird, usual, and unexplained you can find right here on this channel. Just want to thank the um, Seekers, man, who's been tapping in with us, man, summing it up to the channel. I really appreciate that, man. That's how we grow the Seekers, man. But you guys liking the video, subscribing, and hitting that post notification bell, we can grow our community um, together. Found this video for you guys today. Let's do what we do best, Seekers. Let's seek the truth suffered a botched circumcision and was raised as a girl for 13 years. In 1965, David Reimer was born a boy along with his brother in Winnipeg, Canada. But at eight months, he suffered a botched circumcision and unfortunately, his genitals were accidentally burnt off. While his twin brother was fine, David's damage could not be fixed. So David's parents consulted with Dr. John Money and he suggested that David undergo sex reassignment surgery and be given hormones and instead be raised as a girl. His parents took the advice and changed David's birth name from Bruce to Brenda. Dr. Money believed that David could be easily raised as a girl despite being born as a biological male. The doctor even told David's parents to never tell him or his twin brother what happened to him as a baby. As the twins got older, Dr. Money continued to see them for annual checkups, but it's been said that during these appointments, he would make them rehearse sexual acts as he photographed them. Throughout David's childhood, he rejected anything feminine and consistently showed masculine traits. By the time he reached 13 years old, he was suicidal and his mom realized that he wasn't happy being a girl. Soon after, David's father finally told him the truth and immediately he changed his name from Brenda to David. David then began taking testosterone and going through various operations to rebuild his genitals. But he continued to suffer from psychological trauma throughout his life due to Dr. Money's experiment and not long after, his twin brother passed away. And sadly, at the age of 38, David committed suicide. A lot of people blame Dr. Money for David's death, but his defense is that it was the right thing to do at the time. When I think of theme park rides... Were any secrets? That was the right thing to do at the time? I don't think so, man. That whole situation is just crazy and insane, bro. Imagine that happening to you. You didn't realize that till later in any life. Not too many words on that, case seekers. 
it's likely to kill someone, I don't think about the miniature railway. Unfortunately, that's exactly what happened at Gulliver's Land in Milton Keynes. Hugh Doe was 56 and from Newport Pagnell in Bucks. He was an engineer and he was working at Gulliver's Land on May the 10th, 2006. He had been doing some maintenance on the miniature railway train at the theme park and after the work was completed, it's reported that he stood up after giving the driver the all clear to move the train on. Tragically, he was killed instantly when the train went into a tunnel. Hideously, it's reported that he suffered a huge amount of trauma to his skull and brain before being dragged through the 10 foot long tunnel. When a health and safety spokeswoman was asked for comment, she stated that he had been decapitated. She stated, there was probably two and a half to three inches between the top of the carriage and the tunnel. The park was closed to members of the public the day after the incident as a mark of respect for the victim. There was an inquest into Hugh Doe's death. Eventually it was announced that Hugh's death was labeled as misadventure. You think you were actually by this adventure? The thing I'm the most surprised to see because it's at the freaking the theme park they shut down for a day, man. Because you know, usually, man, you be hearing the freaking stories about how to, what happens at these themes park and they just go on. It's like it's just a regular day, man. Because you know, all these corporations cares about is the money. So that's actually really surprising to me that they actually closed down for a day. Man, happened to them, Seekers? The hell? And they labeled it as misadventure. I don't think that's something you should label it like that. Hmm. Anyway, let's continue, Seekers. By your shit. After you literally cut up fucking flesh and bones and eyeballs and brains. Like, who, who the fuck wants to eat shit like that? You never know. You never know. So prison really was not any type of difference for you. When I came on the trial and told my story about how I was kidnapped and how I attacked you and you claimed that I tried to kill you, it was self-defense. You self did try to kill me with a knife. It was self-defense. Oh. You were never going to let me go. blood curdling facts that you... What the... She went to her face-to-face. -face. She was known for cooking people and, and stuff like that and when he tried to defend himself she she said you try to try to and try to take me out i'm like that's a natural response man to anybody would do that you trying to take them out obviously they're going to try to protect and defend themselves too because man what we going through people's minds like i said what they be doing these acts they just think that they can just get away with anything man it truly is like they don't have a grasp on reality seekers what do you guys think about that case you wish you never knew part 13 Hundreds of thousands of bodies have either been lost or buried at sea, so every time you swim in the ocean, you're basically bathing in a graveyard. Chainsaws were originally invented for childbirth. Female mummies in ancient Egypt were always decomposed more than the male ones, and this is because the male bodies were embalmed a lot sooner while the female bodies were kept at the family home until they started to decompose a little bit. And this was to prevent people from having sex with the dead female bodies. Vlad the Impaler was called this because he would place his enemies ass first on pointed poles that would slowly skewer them to death. Fatal familial insomnia is a disease where a person literally cannot go to sleep no matter what they take or what they do. The symptoms get progressively worse until they die of exhaustion. And for the last one, you might want to look up who invented blow up dolls. These are the Wanted people checking that out, see 200 bodies in their funeral home to rot for over four years. They were stealing people's money, not actually cremating their loved ones, and let me just show you their Facebook post and what they were actually doing with this money. Here they are August 10th, 2021, on a family vacation in New York City at the Empire State Building. In October of 2021, it looks like they were actually trying to buy his grandparents' old house. And they say, we had a cash offer ready to go. Mm. Wonder where all that cash came from. Here's November 9th, 2021. Looks like they're in South Beach, Miami now, which is not cheap. Staying at a hotel right on the beach. And here they are just one month later in December of 2021, bragging about their nice hotel in San Francisco. And then in February of 2022, another vacation, this time to Vegas. Him and his wife and his family all going on these vacations. 
Here's a post from December 2021 talking about how he's so happy with where his businesses are at, the right people in the right place doing the right thing at the right time. Yeah, you were never doing the right thing. You're just seekers, man. People like that just like have no morals, man. Like, you're supposed to be taking care of those freaking bodies, and y'all just took the money and ran and just went on lavish vacations, and then you're yeah, acting like you earned their money talking about people being the right place at the right time. No, you cheated and stole that freaking money from the families. Like, the people understand, like, how that that affects them, and you just left all those freaking people, the coffers, man. Like, what happened to their freaking bodies, bro? Man, seekers, man. People, when they be doing these things, I don't think they understand, like, how much it will affect another person. Truly, man. He says that having his own fingers amputated has made him feel more complete. Yet he says he's only 46% of the way to becoming an alien. And what he has planned next is disturbing. This man hails from Montpellier, France, and his name is Anthony Lafredo. Anthony calls himself the Black Alien. He began his transformation at the age of 27, and in order to look less and less like a human, he's already had tattoos all over his body, as well as numerous cosmetic surgeries such as removing his tongue, nose, ears, and two fingers. He's also had his teeth dyed purple, and the whites of his eyes black. He even had silicone implants implanted. To justify all this, he explains, first you have to know what you want, then you have to have the courage to say it, and finally you have to have the energy to do it. According to some sources, his next steps are to have his legs amputated and to become very thin. So we wonder what he'll look like when he's reached 100% of his transformation. And more importantly, we wonder why nobody's stopping him because he's clearly hurting himself. But he says, I'm lucky enough to live the life I want, to do what I want physically. It's absolute freedom. There's no one to stop me. Except that he still complains when he gets kicked out of public places like certain restaurants, which don't hesitate to ask him to leave. And the rare he wants to become an alien seekers and all the videos we covered together this is my first time i heard something like that man and he's going through the process man he's got all those tattoos like i said the first time when i saw him it looked like something had just happened to him like he was in, a, in an incident or something but to hear that he was doing it to himself man because he wanted to become an alien bro and he wants to get this full form like he said he wants to get thinner man Seekers, we're gonna have to check out that case, man. Like, if you guys, if you guys can check it out, find some more details, tell me down below, bro. We gotta find the man, that that human alien, bro. The black alien, that's what they call him. This hmm. lip type is a cupid's bow lip, where the middle of the upper lip dips down, and there are two distinct peaks on either side. You can also see it more clearly here. It's difficult to quantify as there haven't been any high quality studies, but it's mm. thought that less than 5% of people have this lip shape. Interesting. Everyone laughed at him when he married her, but two years later, they regretted it. The story begins with this guy named Sean, who met Amelia and instantly fell in love. But when he would tell his friends about her, they would just laugh. But Sean knew he loved Amelia and was going to propose to her. Amelia had always been bullied because of her weight, but Sean loved her no matter what. When they went out in public, they would get dirty looks. People would laugh at them in the streets. But Sean did not care and decided to marry her. Two years down the line, Amelia had a secret that Sean did not know about. Sean was so in love with Amelia, he decided to marry her regardless of people laughing at him. They got married on the beach and looked very happy. But two years down the line, Amelia had a deep secret. Sean started to notice that something was off. The couple looked happy, but Amelia was keeping something from Sean. Mm -hmm. Amelia had been distant for many months, and one day Sean decided to ask Amelia what was wrong. Amelia finally opened up and said that she had been cheating on Sean. Immediately when Sean heard this, he was shocked. He was so angry and felt betrayed. In Texas, a 17-year-old named Isaac Gonzalez was arrested after cutting his ankle monitor off and taunting police on social media. Gonzalez, a murder suspect, who fired around 100 bullets into a residence. 
resulting in the unintended killing of an innocent woman named Novita Brazil and the injury of another person. He is now facing charges of murder and aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Additionally, an unnamed 15-year-old boy is facing a murder charge in connection to the incident. Mm -hmm. The shooting took place when Gonzalez and the 15-year-old mistakenly targeted the wrong house, believing it to belong to a rival gang. This led to the death of Novita Brazil, a 25-year-old woman who was studying at her home. Following the shooting, the suspects engaged in a high-speed chase with the police and discarded several firearms believed to have been used in the incident. They were initially apprehended, but were able to post bail. During their arrests, both suspects displayed a shocking disregard for law enforcement and the seriousness of their actions. You could tell, man. He's like he was throwing up signs when he was getting taken away. People that need to have more regard, man, for freaking human life, bro. And they did it at the wrong house as well. Just, he was just an innocent bystander, bro. Man. Bone chilling story seekers, bro. Got to be more careful out here, man. You can never know what would happen. This pedophile mom in Ohio committed one of the most horrific crimes I've ever read about. I'm going to add a trigger warning in here right now. This is a very, very disturbing story, so viewer discretion is advised. So this is Ashley Jessup from Ohio. And in 2012, she was found guilty of grape and sentenced to life in prison. But who did Ashley assault? Well, it was her own 10 month old baby. At the time of this crime, Ashley was dating 24 year old Jordan Russell. The two seemed to be very in love and they frequently exchanged explicit materials over email and text message of themselves, obviously. But then in August of 2011, Jordan asked Ashley to do something shocking. He asked her to perform explicit acts on her own 10 month old baby son. And obviously he wanted her to film it and send it to him so he could keep these videos and images. And for some shocking reason, Ashley actually obliged and she performed graphic and gruesome acts on her own son. So later that month, Jordan had actually broken up with Ashley and he already had a new girlfriend. And this new girlfriend of Jordan's was going through his computer when she discovered these extremely disturbing images and contacted the police. So obviously when the details of this case were made public, everybody was absolutely shocked. And the judge in this case actually stated that in his 30 year career, this was one of the most bizarre and disturbing cases he had ever had to cover. So Ashley was eventually convicted of a litany of charges, including assault, grape on a minor, everything like that. And she's still in prison to this day, serving out that life sentence. Now, this is a really, really disturbing story, and I really do think that she should be in prison for a very, very long time. The scene of one of the... Secrets. Like I said, Judge about 30 years, never seen some freaking that weird and bizarre. You don't got not until today, man. It's like these people, when they freaking do these acts, like... They truly don't think about the freaking consequences, man. And they hear that the, the freaking night that and her boyfriend freaking requested it. I feel like something should happen to him as well because he even freaking requested it. He wanted to see something like that. So something's obviously off on his freaking head as well. So I feel like something should happen to him too. It was like, no. Dude, that's getting on something that young as well? What the? F he be jeepy, bro. Damn. The most That's notorious good. crimes of the 1990s is for sale in Boulder, Colorado. The house where mm -hmm. John Benet Ramsey lived and died has hit the market for $6.25 million. I've done my best to match up the listing photos with the crime scene photos, so we're going to take a walk through and see what's changed and what remains the same. But first, let's talk about that price. A recent study done by Real Estate Witch tells us that a full 37% of people would consider it a deal breaker if the home that they were buying was the scene of a violent crime. So let's take a look through and see if you think they changed enough to warrant that high price. Here's what it looked like in 96 on the outside. Since 1998, they installed privacy gates and they actually changed the address of the house. Mm. Here's what the house looks like today inside. 
In this crime scene photo of the dining room, take a look at the French doors. They just painted them black and they left the same hardware. Much of the first floor looks exactly the same as it used to, even down to the curtain rods in this family room. New owners have put in a brand new kitchen. You can see the recognizable black and white tile flooring is gone, but they've kept this walk-in refrigerator and added a new stainless steel panel to the front. In the butler's pantry, the black and white tiling is still there. At first glance, the bathrooms in this house might appear updated. When you look a little closer at these old crime scene photos, you'll see they've added a new sink and top, but this vanity and the drawer pulls are exactly the same. And in some of the bathrooms, the distinctive black tile around the tub is still there. In the primary suite, we see that they replaced the old blue carpeting for some fresh beige carpeting, but not much else has changed. Even the wall sconces are the same. Downstairs in the basement where many think the crime occurred, it's been completely renovated. In this room, the new owners put in a wine cellar. While the rest of the basement used to be a series of storage rooms, it's now one big open entertaining space. Obviously, a lot of this price comes down to the stunning location, but this house was sold in 1998 for only $650,000. And it has been on and off the market at least six times since then. Most recently with a huge price increase. This place is already priced way higher than any homes around it. So what do you guys think? Would you live here? This woman no. was shot and killed by a real life killer clown. Marlene Warren opened her door to see a clown holding flowers and balloons. As the 40 year old woman reached out to take the gift, the clown pulled out a shooting her in front of her son. Her son said this was a full clown costume, makeup, a red nose, wig, and the clown calmly walked away and drove off in a white Chrysler. Mm -hmm. And Marlene Warren sadly passed away in the hospital a short time later. This happened in 1990 in Palm Beach, Florida, but it sadly remained unsolved for 27 years. And the killer was sentenced this year in 2023. Her husband, Michael, looked suspicious because he was not home at the time. But because the elaborate disguise, her son was unable to make a helpful police sketch. Mm. The same year of the murder, a co-worker of Marlene's husband tipped off police that his wife had been having an affair. His wife left him and then Michael, now being widowed, married her in 2002. And in 2017, mm. Sheila King Warren was arrested for the murder of Marlene Warren. So what was the most damning evidence and why would solving this take 27 years? Testimony from a local shop placed Sheila buying the costume two days before the incident. Also, this was May, so I don't know why she picked a clown costume. Here's another photo of her in what I'm assuming is a different clown mm -hmm. costume. Maybe this lady just had a thing for clowns. A white Chrysler was located a few days after Marlene's passing, and inside they found a long brown hair and orange fibers. Similar orange fibers were found in Sheila's home, and they were likely from the clown wig. This was in 1990, and DNA testing was in its infancy. The cold case was reopened, and the brown hair was tested to be Sheila's and Michael's new wife. She was arrested in 2017, but wasn't sentenced mm. until 2023. Sheila was sentenced to just 12 years for the murder as part of a plea deal. And with time served, she's actually going to get out like sometime relatively soon. Michael was not charged, even though I'm sure he knew that his second wife killed his first one. In a recent interview with Michael and Marlene's son, he said that he's just glad to have closure. But what do you guys think? How long should she have gotten for the murder of Marlene Warren? Seekers, man. How long should she have gotten? She just got 12 years, bro. And the case went on so for like 20 damn years. You would think she would get like a harsher sentence. And had that freaking husband. I'm pretty like she said. She's pretty sure that he knew what happened. She just dressed in a freaking full clown costume and just decided to end it all, man. What the hell? Of all the things, why would she be, why was she there, like, obsessed with clowns? Out of all the things she could have wore, she chose a, a clown. That's what's really, like, paying off my freaking head, bro. Hmm. That it. Gotta call it like I see it. This is the Trey Sesler case, the YouTuber who murdered his entire family. This is Trey what? Sesler, and he was known as Mr. Anime on YouTube. Back in the early days of YouTube, Trey was actually a super popular creator on the platform. Mm. And he's also been credited to kickstart the anime community all on YouTube. In his videos, he would review anime, video games, and stuff like that and he got a couple hundred thousand followers. But as time went on, people started to realize something wasn't right. He started to make a lot of videos with weapons in them, mm. like guns, and he also posted images and talked about how he had killed animals. He used real weapons in some of his videos, and he even went to random buildings at night and just shot at them for no reason at all. 
But in 2012, Trey's life would take a disturbing turn. In February of that year, he posted on his channel saying that he was going to reward himself and take a break. But on March 13, 2012, he said he found a new job, which was 100% going to prevent him from posting on YouTube in the future. Mm -hmm. And on March 20th, 2012, Trey decided he was going to kill people. And he decided to start out by killing his family. On that day, he went to his family's home and lured his mom into the garage. And he then shot her in the chest at point-blank range, killing her. He then went back into the house and shot his brother dead in the head. Trey's father, who was sleeping, woke up from all the gunshots and walked over to investigate. And Trey then shot him in the chest, just mm -hmm. like he did to his mom. And to even make it more sinister, after doing this and killing his entire family, he walked around the house killing all the family's pets. He then took ammunition and weapons and started walking towards the high school at the end of the street. And we could all assume what his climactic plan was. Trey later claimed that he wanted to kill at least 70 students at the school so that he could be the deadliest mass killer in United States history. And he said he killed his family first because he didn't want them to see what he was about to do and said that he was completely inspired by the Columbine killers. But thankfully, right before Trey was about to commit the shooting at the school, he backed down and was quickly arrested afterwards. Also, after the shootings, it was discovered that he had written a lot of stuff all over the doors and walls and this was evidence that he had been disturbed for quite a long time. This is just an insane case, and I can't believe stuff like this happens so consistently in our world. 911, where is your emergency? Uh, my house. Okay, what's the emergency? Uh, I just killed my mom and my sister. You just killed your mother and your sister? How did you do that? Uh, I shot him with a uh, 22 revolver. Are you sure they're dead? Yes. Okay, I want you to stay on the phone with me, okay? Are you all right? Yeah, I'm fine. Okay. Where is the gun? Uh, it's on the kitchen counter. Is there any reason that you were so angry at your mother and your sister? Uh, I don't know. I, uh, I wasn't, it's weird. I wasn't even really angry with them. It just kind of happened. I've been kind of uh, planning on uh, killing for a while now. The two of them, or just anybody? Pretty much anybody. Why? I don't know. I, uh, I, I don't really like uh, people's uh, kind of attitude. Right. I think they're kind of, they're very, uh, like, you know, emotional, I don't know, verbally rude to each other and stuff like that. Right. I don't know. It's, it's okay. It's just my family. I don't know. They're just kind of really... I, I guess this is really selfish to say, but to me, they, I felt like they were just suffocating me in a way. I don't know. Uh, I, I, I think, I, obviously, you know, I'm pretty, uh, I guess, evil, but, uh, you know, what a... Okay, uh, are you, no, don't be sorry. I'm listening, okay? You have my undivided attention. This, this is really gonna mess me up for this, you know, in the future, uh, being my sister. I told my sister that my mom needed her. Mm -hmm. She was in her room, and she came out of her room, and uh, I shot her, rolled down the stairs, and I shot her again, and I went down, and I shot my mom about maybe three or four times. But I'll never forget that my uh, sister, she came down the stairs, and she was dreaming, and I was telling her that I'm sorry, but to just told Bill mm -hmm. that, you know, I was just gonna make it go away, you know, but she was kept on freaking out, but finally she fell down and I shot her in the head about probably three times. So they're both downstairs? Uh, yes. Okay, where are you? In the kitchen. Okay, you're not sitting by the gun, are you? No, it's about like 10 or 15 feet away from me. All right, where's your dad? He's out of town. Do you know where he is? Out of town? Washington, D.C. Okay. And, uh, for, I guess, future reference, I don't really want to be any of my family members, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, like if they're visiting or whatever, I, I don't know how it works or anything, but I, I just don't want any type of visitors. This girl was kept in a box. The freaking... The head that she just said, it's okay, and I have your undivided attention. I, I know it was her free... I guess it was her job, I guess, to keep him on the phone, just to keep his focus, but... Damn, like I said, I can never do that type of job because you have to hear things like that every day, boy. You just have to be calm. You have to try to freaking keep them on the phone. 
even like when you hear him do those horrific acts, man. Small man, sister, bro. Our Peter, then. Damn, bro. And he was just talking so calmly, too. Like I said, I never understood that aspect. I don't know how people do it. See, because I just don't. Fox and uses a sex slave for seven years. 20 year old Colleen Stan is an American woman who was kidnapped and held as a sex slave by Cameron and Janice Hooker in their California home for over seven years between 1977 and 1984. Mm -hmm. Her case has received international fame and has been a subject of many books, films, and television series. On May 19, 1977, Colleen Stan was hitchhiking from her home in Eugene, Oregon to a friend's home in Northern California where she was heading to a birthday party. Cameron Hooker kidnapped 20-year-old Colleen after picking her up. Colleen said she was a very experienced hitchhiker and had allowed two rides to go past her mm. before accepting the ride with Cameron Hooker. Colleen said she felt confident climbing into the blue van because Hooker's wife Janice and their baby were in the car. They then stopped at a gas station along the way and Colleen went to use the restroom. And she said a voice told her to run out and jump out the window and never look back, but she never did, which she definitely regrets. When they left, they got on the highway, and Cameron Hooker pulled over on the side of the road and put a knife to Colleen's throat, all the way until they got to an isolated area. Mm. She was then locked in a wooden box that was designed to prevent light, sound, and fresh air entering. After this, Colleen was tortured and kept locked in the box for 23 hours a day, until she was given a contract and forced to sign herself into slavery for life in January 1978. Her kidnapper also said that they were being watched by a powerful organization called The Company, and if she ever tried to escape, they would torture her and harm her family. Colleen then became a slave and her new name was Kay, and she was forced to call Cameron Master. Cameron then started raping Colleen, and it was mostly consisting of oral rape. Cameron reportedly didn't want to have normal sex with Colleen, because he considered that to breach his agreement with his wife. Instead, he raped her with objects. To avoid painful punishments, Colleen tried to comply with Cameron's commandments, which later led to her being allowed to go out to jog and work in the yard, and even help him with bigger stuff like an underground dungeon for more slaves. Even with an open door, neighbors, and a telephone, she never made an attempt to escape because her fear of the company kept her from seeking help. Mm. Additionally, Stan was also allowed to visit her family by herself in 1981, but did not reveal her situation due to her fear of the possible consequences from the company. Her family thought she was involved in some sort of cult, and they did not want to pressure her to stay in fear that she would stay away forever. The next day, Colleen returned for a second visit with Cameron posing as her boyfriend. Cameron feared that he had given his slave too much freedom and took her back to his home, where he locked her in the wooden box under his waterbed. She remained in the box 23 hours a day for the next three years. Colleen would go to the bathroom using a bed pen, which she positioned under herself with her feet. Once Cameron's children had gone to bed, he would take Colleen out of the box and feed her and torture her. Colleen was not allowed to make any noise, and she had to stay still for 23 hours a day in the complete dark, with little to no air to breathe. In the summer, the box would get over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. In 1983, Colleen was allowed to get a job as a maid at a hotel, and Cameron wanted her to become his second wife, which was a turning point for Janice, who is his wife. And in August 1984, Janice began struggling with herself and went to Colleen. She then told her that Cameron was not part of the company and the company wasn't even real. Because... Janice then helped Colleen escape to a bus station where they had Colleen's parents help bring her home. Colleen Stan is still alive today, and she experiences PTSD and has extreme back and shoulder injuries, which is from being trapped in a small box for seven years straight. This case is extremely gut-turning, and could you ever imagine this happening to you? Luckily, Cameron Hooker was found guilty of kidnapping and sexual assault and was sentenced to 104 years in prison. Insane secrets, bro. Truly a freaking evil case, man. Seekers, if you guys stay with me to the end of the video, you're a true seeker, seeking the truth. I greatly appreciate your support, man. Like I said, guys, in order for us to grow, man, I need you guys to hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, man. Hit that post notification button as well. Just do those three simple steps, man. We can grow. Like I said, I appreciate you guys for supporting these past couple of videos. We're going to keep going, man. Haven't missed a day of March, bro, so we got to clap it up, man. You guys, I'm catching the next one, man. I'm out. Peace, seekers.